Good morning and welcome to what will be our uh, what will be our final uh, official uh, Anne Arundel County delegation meeting. Um, I am Delegate Heather Bagnell, Chair of the Delegation with Vice Chair Delegate Dana Jones. Before we conduct further introductions, I would ask everyone to welcome Delegate Mike Rogers, District 32, who, who will be offering our pledge and our prayer today. Mr. Rogers, Delegate Rogers, Mr. you're on, you're on oh, mute. Yes. Oh, I, I had already completed the pledge. I thought everyone, I'm sorry. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. I I so apologize. I, I did it on mute. So, okay. All right. So we all can bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we come together here with less than 18 days to go in session. We ask you to give us the strength and the wisdom to do all we can to serve everyone that we can in the great state of Maryland. We ask you for these blessings and, and, and providence in your precious name. Amen. Amen. And I think I just saw Delegate uh, Gary Simmons from District 12B, welcome. Good morning, good morning, everyone. How are we doing? Uh, it is wonderful to see you. Welcome. Uh, Thank you. We are very pleased to have you with us today virtually. We're really looking forward to you joining us on Monday uh, back in person. Mm -hmm. And we're so glad that um, that that uh, you're 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 healing and and feeling better. So. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I also want to welcome our senators. Uh, we have Senator Don Guile from District 33, Senator Pam Vidal from District 32, Senator Brian Simonier from District 31, Senator Sarah Elfrith from District 30, Senator Jim Rosapet from District 21, and Senator Clarence Lamb from District 12. We also want to welcome our guests, the Anne Arundel County chapter of the AARP, who are watching uh, virtually, as well as the Maryland Retired School personnel. And we also have Pete Barron, Hannah Dyer, and Ethan Hunt from the County Executive's Office joining us. I want to recognize our Council, Matt Carpenter, our Delegation Secretary, Roger Massey, my Chief of Staff, Rory Nolan, and Josh Paper, Chief of Staff to Vice Chair Jones, who are providing technical support once again for our meeting. And as I said, this will be our last official delegation meeting for the 2023 legislative session. To our members, we will have a capital budget subcommittee th uh, this coming week and a voting session next week. So please watch your email for details. And as a reminder, all of our delegation meetings will be on Zoom due to space constraints. Uh, I'm going to change the agenda order a bit uh, and vote on the Senate cross files of our House bills and then we'll have the hearing on Senate Bills 227 and 692. Do we have quorum? Let me just make sure we've got, yeah, we should have our members. All right, um, so uh, let me go to um, Senate Bill 229 was the cross file of House Bill 1130, the noise monitoring systems. Now to refresh your memory, this is the bill that we uh, we voted on on the floor um, with the understanding that the House was going to conform to the Senate bill and the Senate bill um, uh, did remove uh, the, the, the financial penalties. This bill uh, passed uh, the delegation not unanimously. And um, Mr. Carpenter, if you can fill in any blanks that I might have missed, before we take the vote, if there's any 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 context you, um, you want to add, uh, you covered it very well. All right, thank you very much. Um, with that, um, are there any questions from the members? Senator Vidal, go ahead. Th thank you, Madam Chair. Please explain. You remove the financial penalty. Uh, 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 we didn't remove the financial penalty. Um, uh, the the when we talked to uh, delegate. Julie Polakovich Carr, she mentioned that the Senate, um, that the way the Senate bill came out um, had, had removed a financial penalty and that the House was going to conform to the Senate bill. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? 
what was the, the final? Delegate Chisholm. Oh, Thank sorry, you, sorry, Dele Delegate Chisholm and then Delegate Rogers. Thank you, Madam Chair. So now explain to me kind of how it works. So let's say somebody's in violation, I guess they get pulled over or do they just get a warning sent to their house or do they get the, the, the police officer is going to pull them over and just give them a warning for now? Is that, is that kind of the accountability part? Senator Vidal or, or Mr. Carpenter, would either of you? Yes, I can take that question. Uh, the, uh, the agency shall ma mail a warning to the, the individual's uh, residents. Okay, thank you. Delegate Rogers, you had a question? Thank you, Madam Chair. No, I just had a question regarding the, the financial penalties. I mean, I know it was stated that they were removed, but um, what what were they? Mr. Carpenter, you, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, the financial penalties weren't uh, explicitly stated. It just stated a civil penalty may be issued. So there wasn't an exact amount. Okay. Senator Vidal, go ahead. Sorry, I missed it. And I just tried to reread the bill in the third reading and nothing is mentioned about a, an amendment removing any penalty. So does this mean if if you're stopped or if you get a, a civil citation because you're speeding from a camera that there is no civil penalty? Matt, do you know? Oh, uh, this is this is the this is not the speed cameras. This is the 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 the, the noise, noise camera. I'm sorry. You're absolutely right. Thank you. No, um, no problem at all. Too many counties. Thank, thank, thank you for the clarification. My apologies if I said if I said um, speed monitoring. It's it's it, this is the noise monitoring system. That was the that was the logic behind um, the, the removing the civil penalties because it is a pilot and this is and this is sort of piloting new technology. So they so they didn't want to um, sort of lead with with the penalty was my understanding um, from from the conversations that were happening between the House and Senate. Thank you, Madam Chair. Any further questions from the body? All right, thank you very much. If I can have um, a, a, a motion on the bill. No favorable. Second. Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Um, uh, if uh, Mr. Secretary, if you could call the roll. This vote is for Senate Bill 229, Noise Monitoring Systems. Vice Chair Jones. Yes. Delegate Barnes, Delegate Barnes, Delegate Bartlett. Yes. Delegate Chang. Yes. Delegate Chisholm. Ye no. Delegate Henson. Yes. Delegate Howard. No. Delegate Kipke. Yes. Delegate Lehman. Delegate Layman. Delegate Munoz. Yes. Delegate Pena Melnick. Yes. Delegate Prusky. Yes. Delegate Rogers. Yes. Delegate Smith. Yes. Delegate Simmons. Yes. Chairwoman Bagnall. Yes. By a vote of 12 to 2 with two absent, the motion carries. Senator Vito, I saw your hand. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just I do want to clarify <clears throat> this was this came in as a statewide bill, did not come in as a local bill. And the amendment uh, made a pilot in certain counties. And because I was the sponsor on the statewide bill, um, at JPR insisted that we be one of the pilots. So um, initially, so the changes that have been made on this bill are made statewide, not just for Anne Arundel County. I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I really appreciate the clarification. Um, obviously, when we were voting on the House bill, um, because because it, it, it originally was statewide, and then we were amended in as, as part of the pilot, we were um, working on the fly. So I appreciate you giving us the context. Um, uh, with, uh, with that, let's go ahead and move to uh, Senate Bill 679. This was the cross file of House Bill 710, the Anne Arundel County Speed Monitoring. This is the, the speed monitoring bill. Um, and the, the two bills are, uh, are identical. 
Um, Mr. Carpenter, if you want to add any context, if I missed anything. Covered it. All right, thank you very much. Um, if I could have a motion on Senate Bill 679. Move favorable. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, Mr. Secretary, if you could call the roll. This vote is for Senate Bill 679, Anne Arundel County Speed Monitoring. Vice Chair Jones. Yes. Delegate Barnes. Delegate Barnes. Delegate Bartlett. Yes. Delegate Chang. Yes. Delegate Chisholm. No. Delegate Henson. Yes. Delegate Howard. No. Delegate Kipke. No. Delegate Layman. Delegate Layman. Delegate Munoz. No. Uh, Delegate Munoz again? No. Delegate Pena Melnick. Yes. Delegate Prusky. Yes. Delegate Rogers. Yes. Delegate Smith. No. Delegate Simmons. Yes. Madam Chair. Yes. By a vote of nine to five with two absent, the motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. All right, our final vote today is on Senate Bill 472. It is the cross file of House Bill 520. This is the City of Annapolis Alcoholic Beverages Art Establishment. Um, this, uh, the, the bills are uh, identical and this, this bill did initially pass, um, the House bill did pass this delegation unanimously. Um, Mr. <laughs> Thank you, it's been moved. Do I have a second? Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Mr. Secretary, if you could call the roll. This vote is for Senate Bill 472, City of Annapolis Alcoholic Beverages for Art Establishments. Vice Chair Jones. Yes. Delegate Barnes. Delegate Barnes. Delegate Bartlett. Yes. Delegate Chang. Yes. Delegate Chisholm. Yes. Delegate Henson. Yes. Delegate Howard. Yes. Delegate Kipke. Yes. Delegate Layman. Delegate Layman. Delegate Munoz. Yes. Delegate Pena Melnick. Delegate Pena Melnick. Yes. Delegate Prusky. Yes. yes. Delegate Rogers. Yes. Yes. Smith. Yes. Delegate Simmons. Yes. Madam Chair. Yes. By vote of 14 to zero with two absent, the motion carries. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. And thank you to all the members uh, for, for your efficiency. I greatly appreciate it. We're going to go ahead and go to our bill hearings now. Um, we have two, two Senate bills that did not have um, House cross files. Senate Bill uh, 227, which is uh, the Anne Arundel County Abandoned Vehicles, and Senate Bill 962, which is the Anne Arundel County Alcoholic Beverages Licenses Residency Requirement. Um, members, you should have, oh, uh, Delegate Pena Melnick, you had a hand. Yes, on that last vote, I was saying yes. I'm not sure if I was heard. Mr. Secretary, did, did, did we get um, Delegate Pena Melnick in the count? Uh, yes, I have that as an affirmative. All right. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. Th thank you, Delegate Pena Melnick. Um, uh, so uh, members, you should have received in your email um, the uh, the. Uh, Amendment from um, Senator Vidal on Senate Bill 227, um, which uh, I think is, is a clarifying amendment to the intent of the bill. Um, with that, I will go ahead and turn the hearing over to Senator Vidal. Thank you so much and, and, and welcome. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. It's ha happy to be here on a Friday morning. Um, I also have with me um, Mr. Pete Barron and uh, Matt Bennett from the county because I really I put this bill in at the request of the county executive. So you all, if you all haven't had calls about dirt bikes, I don't know why it's not affecting you. I've been working on a dirt bike issue since I was in the county council. And so we have these issues where you know, we call them dirt bikes, but they're really, they're using them on the roads. They're, they're out on public roads. It's causing a real safety hazard with people. And there's not much enforcement we can do. Typically, the vehicles aren't licensed. The drivers aren't licensed. So it's a real problem. The amendment looks huge. And when I, when I researched the amendment yesterday, the first four pages of the amendment are current code. It's it's not the amendment. It doesn't look, it's not as big as it looks. So really what affects Santa Rosa County that's not in current code is the bottom of your page four, where it talks about in Santa Rosa County regulating the operation of all-terrain vehicles, off-road motorcycles and motorized mini bikes, enforcing Maryland vehicle law for violations involving these vehicles, enacting and implementing le legislation, which will be up to the county council and allowing the impoundment, the conditions for release, and if lawful, the forfeiture. So that's the that's the county part of this bill. Um, I, I'd be happy to take questions. I'm sure Mr. Barron and Mr. Bennett will be happy to take questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Senator. Do we have uh, questions from the members? Um, let's start with Delegate Bartlett and then Delegate Henson. Thank you, Senator Biodo, for bringing this bill. I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to um, to ask you a question on it, and I and I want to and hopefully we either have the answer or maybe um, Mr. Carpenter can help us with. Um, I know we're going to be enforcing Maryland vehicle law for violations involving ATVs and off road motorcycles and motorized motorbikes. Is it possible that we can find out what those um, do we know those um, those penalties that are attached to those? And if we don't, I mean, I, I, I can look them up as well, but I didn't know if, if perhaps either you or Mr. Carpenter had that information at the ready. Madam, I did not. Um, Madam Delegate, I don't see the penalties in the bill. But um, I do know that, it, you know, like it's enforcing the Maryland law. The big issue is the impoundment of vehicles when they when they find these on public roads. And I, I think if I'm not mistaken, Mr. Bennett, that was the whole purpose of trying to introduce that, this amendment to be, was to be able, you know, if we take the vehicle, then you can call the parent, say, come and get your vehicle. Um, so it's it's the impounding of the vehicle that's so important. But I don't okay. know if there's any financial penalties. OK, I see. And, and Mr. Bennett, if you wanted to, um, I, I see you nodding your head, so yeah. I, I'm assuming you're confirming. I didn't know if you had something else you wanted to add. Senator Biddle's correct. We're, um, I don't know the penalties off the top of my head. They're in state law. Um, it's, um, But this bill is just giving the county the, the authority to enforce that law. Currently, we, we don't have the authority to to enforce the state law as it relates to these these vehicles and then senator Biddle's correct um we also don't have the authority to to sort of put a separation between the user of the vehicle and the payment of any fines and so this this bill would would give Anne Arundel County the authority to um hold that vehicle until all fines are paid related to the violation and again it's just authorizing Anne Arundel County to consider laws um related to that Okay, and one more question, Mr. Bennett and uh, Madam Chair, if I may, really quickly. Um, off the top of your head, is there is there any jail time associated with these violations? I don't know off the top of my head. Again, okay. it's, it's going to be state law, um, but I, I, I don't know um, whether there's uh, jail time associated with these. Okay, well, I will look it up for myself. Thank you very much. I appreciate you both for giving me those answers and I'm assuming there probably is not, but the point is, is that the county can um, can enforce put the enforcement mechanisms in um, that they want. So even if the state says there is jail time, the county could actually um, not have jail time and may and 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 merely just have fines, which would be um, my preference. But anyway, um, thank you so much. I appreciate you um, indulging. Thank you, Delegate Bartlett. And we'll um, we'll try and get the answers for that and make sure we share them with the entire delegation. Um, we're not gonna be voting these bills today. Um, this bill will have a hearing in um, uh, Environment and Transportation next week on the 30th. 
So we'll make sure to have a voting session before that, but I wanted to make sure that the members had time to get their questions answered. Delegate Henson, did you still have a question or, or was your question answered? Delegate Bartlett asked my question and then my only other question was procedure on if we would be voting today. Thank you for the clarification. You are very welcome. Um, uh, with, oh, sorry, go ahead, uh, Mr. Barron. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and, and sorry to interrupt, but I just wanted to add two quick points. Um, one, one quick correction to, to the Senator. Uh, this bill came at the request of two county council members, uh, not, the, not the county executive. The county executive supports it. I just want to make sure Councilwoman Pickard and Councilman Volke uh, get recognized for their work on this issue. Thank you. Thank you very much for the clarification. Um, if there are no other questions, um, this concludes the hearing on Senate Bill 227, and we'll turn to Senate Bill 962, Anne Arundel County Alcoholic Beverages Licenses Residency Requirement. Once again, uh, welcome Senator Beidel. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. And this is a much easier bill. <clears throat> this came at the request of, of um, our beverage association, our, our liquor board. And it came late, it's a late file bill. So I didn't ask for a cross file. I had enough trouble getting it out of rules in the Senate. Um, but what it simply says is that if, you, if you're gonna get a liquor license, if you apply for a liquor license in Anne Arundel County, you must be a Maryland resident. And if at any point in time, you're not a Maryland resident, resident you, you will not be able to continue your liquor license. So it gives a little more flexibility. Um, I think it gives us an opportunity to have um, multiple locations for certain restaurants. And so, um, as, as I said, it, it really is at the, at the request of the, um, the Anne Arundel County Liquor Board, and I hope that we can support it. Other counties have done this. This was a little late file because we saw what some other counties were doing. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Senator. Are there questions from the members? Seeing none, I just had one question, um, Senator. I didn't, um, I didn't see if it had a, a hearing date in the House. Um, because I just want to make sure that, that that we're being cognizant of uh, of 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 your hearing dates in terms of, of, of voting and getting the letters to, to the committees. Madam Chair, thank you for that very important question, because I'm going to need your help getting in out of rules in the House. OK, so it's so it's in rules. Yes. All right. Thank you. That 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 is that is very helpful to know. <laughs> Actually, I believe we voted it out of committee this week. It hasn't been voted off the floor of the Senate. So if I can alert you once it gets voted out of the Senate and then if you could help me get it out of rules, I'd appreciate it. Perfect. Thank you very much. And again, that's procedural. We, you know, good, good for us to know as we're as we're uh, proceeding forward. Um, if there are no other questions. Thank you very much, Senator. That concludes the hearing on Senate Bill 962. Um, and we are going to move to our guests. Our first guest today is our, our newly minted Anne Arundel County Sheriff Everett Sesker. Um, new to this office, but not new to Anne Arundel County. Um, and we're very, very excited uh, to, to, to have you here representing us and, and speaking before the delegation. So welcome, welcome Sher Sheriff Sesker. Uh, senators, delegates, thank you for having me this morning. Um, and I guess we'll just get right into it because I know you guys are busy. You have a full schedule. So I am here to discuss my budget. And let me say this first. I know that this is a, a county funded budget, but whatever influence or whatever assistance you can give me with some of my one time expenses would be greatly appreciated. And I will just jump right into it. Um, one of the things that we are looking at funding is direct charge vehicles. Uh, direct charge vehicles is a, uh, a band-aid for us instead of getting new, new vehicles. So picture when uh, county cars, county police cars, or county sheriff's cars, they are deadlined or whatever for various reasons because they've reached a certain age or they've reached a certain mileage. Well, what we've done here in the office of the sheriff, we have a direct charge account. So we take some of those cars and we keep them in the fleet, you know, um, and that allows us to give deputies who may not have vehicles to give them cars. I've asked the county to uh, fund that budget so I can supply the remaining deputies who do not have vehicles at that time at this time to have cars. I'm looking for a total of one hundred and thirty four thousand four hundred dollars. 
Now that's just an increase from the budget that we already have. That's around $30,000. What that does is that helps me with recruitment. As you know, we're competing against other agencies where every officer will be issued a car, even our sister county in Prince George's County, the Prince George's County Sheriff's Office, all of their deputies have cars. How does that help the county? Well, it allows more visibility on the streets. When we have deputies traveling in the county, through the county, people see the also the sheriff's car. And what people don't understand is that we do assist the county police with traffic stops. We conduct traffic stops. As you all are well aware, um, at the Triple Eight incident with the mass shooting at the Capitol Gazette, deputies were the first to respond there on scene and make apprehension. Just a few months ago, we had an escape of a prisoner from uh, the Jennifer uh, Road facility, detention facility. Uh, deputies were the one who made apprehension. Right now, what happens with my deputies is that um, the ones who are assigned to the courthouse, they don't have vehicles. I've actually had deputies use their personal vehicles to do uh, business for the sheriff. I would love to be able to give them the vehicles. And then when we have down days at the courthouse, I can assign them to other tasks such as warrant services, serving summonses, subpoenas, whatever. Um, when we have holidays right now, all of my deputies, about half of my staff go home for the holidays. Other half is still working. I wanna keep them all working. The next thing on the list is to establish an office of professional standards. Um, in today's climate, with everything that's been going on with police misconduct and things like that, we cannot afford to have a professional office of standards that oversees um, police operations. My office of professional uh, standards will be divided into two sections. It will consist of uh, the investigative portion, which will be internal affairs, so that will investigate all complaints that come in from the outside and all internal complaints that may arise. And then there'll be an inspection side. The inspection side is the proactive side. Look at it like this. Deputies, we, they go out, they interact with people on a daily basis, whether it be evictions or, or whether it be a warrant service. This side will have the responsibility of contacting individuals that who have contact with deputies to ensure that we uh, operated in a professional manner did things according to Maryland state law, um, our, our procedures and things like that. And this office will also be overseen by a commander, um, a commander of the rank of captain. Right now, I have a, a corporal who is uh, the sole person in this office. He has no authority to give orders, to compel people, to write statements or anything like that. And he also represents me from time to time on the police accountability board when they have meetings. We need a person of a, a position that, that says this, this office is serious and also when he meets with um, citizens and things like that. The next thing that I have is the completion of what I call an executive command staff. We have three bureaus here, uh, field operations, Bureau of Administration, in the Bureau of, Bureau of Security Operations, which is the courthouse. Right now, I have one captain. I have one captain in my command staff. I have a, another position for another captain that I will promote to, but each bureau should have a captain and a lieutenant overseeing it. Right now, like I said, I have one captain. That, that hinders me from planning for future events and things like that. My command staff is basically uh, union members. So when I try to do uh, hold a meeting for future planning or anything like that, um, dealing with personnel issues, my command staff, I meet with them, and then the next day they can be at the uh, FOP uh, lodge meeting discussing what I, what I, I told them. So it kind of hinders me there. And again, you want somebody of authority, such as a captain over the top of each bureau, so that person can give commands and orders to uh, the, the people under them. And also it allows me, in my absence, for my lieutenant colonel to act, in, act as the sheriff, and it allows somebody with the appropriate right to move up into the colonel's position. Right now, if I take off and the, the colonel uh, assumes my position, you may have 
a lieutenant acting as the chief deputy of the sheriff's office and who is also a union member. So another thing that I have is a loading dock x-ray machine. Now I met with the, the county and the county executive. It seems as if at this point they may fund that. It's a, it's a request of $70,000. Um, it seems that they will fund that, but I'm asking you, it's a one-time expense. I think if I could get some financial support from you guys, maybe I could take uh, that 70,000 they were gonna give me and put it elsewhere, probably to the direct charge vehicles. Like I said, the direct charge vehicles, we already have an account of 30,000 and we're looking for a total of 134. So if we add the 70 to that, I think that will go a long ways in assisting me. In the last thing that I have on my list, and everything that I'm asking for is not wants, it's needs. So let me just reemphasize that it is needs. Is a government government affairs coordinator. Um, coming into this position, I, I, I must admit, I, I did not have, it, there was no playbook for this. So for me to have the ability to meet with you on a regular basis, or at least have someone meet meet in, in, in my staff on a regular basis would be very helpful. Excuse me, let me turn this off. Would be very helpful. Um, someone that could also meet with you, someone that can meet with the county council, provide a, a written uh, documentation and stuff like that to me. Um, also guide me on different bills, make bills that I should probably be aware of. And also someone that can meet with the Maryland Police Correctional Training Commission. You know, that would free me up to actually do the job of the sheriff. Let me go back to this officer of professional um, responsibility. This is a big thing because what people don't understand is they're not going to look at Sheriff Sesker if something should happen in the office of the sheriff. They're going to look at Anne Arundel County. A lot of people think that I actually work for the county executive, you know. So it's not just going to be on the office of the sheriff. It's going to be on Anne Arundel County. This is a request, which I, I like to say is a definite need. Right now, I have one person that is conducting investigations for my entire agency of 116 16 people. You cannot find any agency with this many people with one person that's dedicated to it. And I was just meeting with my chief deputy the other day. And we had conversations about the complaints and the investigations. Well, they're picking up now. And they're not picking up because my people are not are doing something differently, but they're picking up now because there's new leadership at the Office of the Sheriff, myself and the Chief Deputy, and things that probably slid by or slid under the radar before, we're now saying, no, this needs to be, this needs to be investigated. This needs to be looked at. So Again, I know that, you know, a lot of the requests I'm asking for, they, they require funding after funding after funding, but whatever influence that you may have to help me accomplish my goals here and get this funding to move the Office of the Sheriff forward would be greatly appreciated. And I am open to any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, Sheriff Sesker. Um, I see a hand from Delegate Prusky. Uh, thank yes. you, Madam, Madam Chair. Uh, Sheriff Sesker, thank you again for that presentation. I think uh, you gave a great uh, presentation on your priorities and explained to us what the sheriff does. Uh, and I just do have a question, though, because this has been an ongoing issue. How is your staffing? Um, and I know you mentioned it because the police department, fire department, everybody with public safety right now is struggling. But you're even uh, even further, you know, in that challenge. So can, can you just tell us how that's going uh, in Anne Arundel? Well, I, I, I will say this. We are we are slated for 87 sworn, including myself and my uh, colonel. So really we, we have 85 and we are 11 down right now. And we are struggling to keep the people that we have. We are also struggling to get people. And the reason being because right now, although there are fewer people that wanna be um, uh, in law enforcement, the competition is stiff. We're competing against our, our other agency, our other sister agency, the Anne Arundel County Police, um, where they have a, I think a $20,000 signing bonus that they're offering to people and we don't have that. 
We don't have a signing bonus. Their uh, pay scale is actually much higher than ours. I actually had a corporal um, before I got here who left us to go to the county police because his pay, his pay increased that much more. I have a uh, deputy right now that's actually uh, interested in leaving and he's entertaining a possibility of going to uh, the District of Columbia. Um, he said because he cannot afford to move out of his mother's house on our salary. Um, when I talk about the direct charge vehicles, that actually can be considered a one-time cost because if we could get funding from you, the county has entertained the idea of, well, we do the direct charge vehicles and then we gradually phase them out and we provide new vehicles for everybody. But also, not only is it a crime deterrent, but it's a recruiting tool also, you know, because that's what people look for. If you, if you notice now, um, that is one of the things that law enforcement agencies are saying. You will get a personal vehicle, you know, for your use. Um, again, at, uh, Prince George's County Sheriff's Office, we're competing against them. All of their deputies get vehicles. Now, these vehicles are not just for personal use. Again, we will make sure they are used for the Office of the Sheriff business. You know, they will know that if you're driving this vehicle off duty and you see something, you must act on it. You know, you must back up the county police. If we back up the county police, that's one less county police officer that has to come to assist someone else and they can respond to different calls for service. So as far as like, you know, where we are right now, I must admit, we're struggling to get people. We are struggling to get people. And the same thing goes for my civilian staff also. I'm about nine down on civilians. We're slated for 31 and I'm nine down. We're looking for dispatchers. Um, it's hard for us to, again, recruit against the uh, fire department. We've had one of our dispatchers leave to go to um, um, animal control, to be a dispatcher there because the pay was better. I hope, I hope that answered your question. Thank Kelly. you. It did. Thank you very much, Sheriff. Um, I had seen Delegate Simmons' hand. Delegate Simmons? Yes, I just wanted to, number one, thank uh, Sheriff Sesker for coming on today and discussing the needs of the department. Obviously, as we continue to assess our first responders here in the county, it's very important that we have a better understanding that's what's needed on the front lines, especially those who protect our county and our residents. I just wanna thank him and let him know that we are listening to his needs and we'll definitely try to do all we can to assist in that matter. Well, well uh, Delegate Simpson, let me say this. I, I want to thank you all. Um, you guys have been uh, very good to me over, over my short time here. So again, let me just say, whatever you can do for me, whether it be influence or one-time expenditure, it will greatly be appreciated. Thank you. I just wanted to reiterate the, the words of my colleagues and say thank you very much. Um, and thank you for taking a deep dive into the office of the sheriff for Anne Arundel County, because it, it makes a big difference. Um, uh, Delegate Chisholm, I just saw your hand. No, no, thank you. Um, I'm just going to echo everybody's thoughts on the sheriff. I appreciate the job you're doing. I know it's not an easy job. Anything we can do to help, um, I know that it's a thankless job at times, and it's tough, but I appreciate the professionalism and the way you've transitioned thus far, and it's been great to see. And anything we can do to support that, please reach out. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Sheriff Sesker, and we will we will we will take your 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 words to heart um, and 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 talk amongst our delegation as to how how best to support the the office of the sheriff. Thank you, thank you, everybody. Just, thank you, have a Madam great Chair. Day. Oh, yeah. um, Delegate Rogers, go ahead. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, sheriff Sesker, just one thing. I mean, very very helpful information. Um, would you happen to have that in like a, a slide presentation or, or something in writing that you could provide to the delegation? Yes, I, I can make that happen. I, I can get you that. Yeah, it'd be helpful just to kind of look at it and, and study the numbers a little bit. Um, okay. Very, very helpful. But thank you for the presentation and, and always thank you for, for the job that you're doing. All right. Thank you, Delegate. Thank you, Delegate Rogers. Great, uh, great question. Because I was writing frantically. It's 
<laughs> nice to know that we might be able to just have a presentation. Um, with that, we're going to go ahead and turn to our next guest, um, Anne Arundel County uh, Library, uh, Skip Ald, who is a, a huge advocate of uh, libraries, of our library system, of our young people, of education in general. Um, Skip, welcome. Welcome, and thanks for being here. Uh, thank you, Chair Bagnell. It's great to see everyone. Uh, hello, hello to the delegation. Um, I have a presentation that I would like to to present by sharing my screen. I'm not positive I can do that, but um, but let me do that in just a moment. First, I'd like to introduce two people who are with me. The chair of our board of trustees is Chris Nelson, formerly president of St. John's College, and we also have Christine Feldman, who is our director of marketing and communications. Um, Chris, I think you maybe wanted to say a couple of words to begin with. I just wanted to uh, thank the delegation for his support over the years. It's been extremely important for the library. And uh, let me just extend an invitation on behalf of the library system and the board of trustees to have you visit one or more of our local libraries across the, across the county. Uh, it's a privilege to be with you and, and thank you for that. Okay, well, uh, with that, uh, thank you. And let me go ahead and see if I can share my screen here. Um, you should have access. Let me know if you have trouble with that. Are you seeing Are you seeing it? Wait a minute. Ah, here we go. Okay, so let me get started with this. Okay, so um, first thing I wanted, uh, wait a minute. First thing I wanted to share is our, our um, basic statistics from our annual report. In the past year of 20, fiscal 2022, we saw lots of our customers uh, returning to the library after, after some of them stayed away during the pandemic. We had a dip in, in numbers, but as you see, we have um, you know thousands of residents have their library card and are attending programs. So a lot of things are happening in the library still. Um, we During the pandemic, we went virtual in a lot of ways. We had virtual story times where hundreds of, of kids and families were, were tuning in and, and we just, we did curbside service. We did, we're really just now hopefully thinking that the pandemic is in our rear view mirror. But, but uh, as you see, hundreds of thousands of people are using the libraries. Um, we we've always done kindergarten readiness programming, but over the past couple of years, we've really enhanced that work. What you see here is a story time attended by about 100 people that was done out outdoors at Annapolis Town Center last year. Um, we had some real storytellers, but we also had myself and, and County Executive Pittman um, doing some some story time reading at that event. Whoops. Uh, let me go back. Sorry about that. Um, wanted to um, wanted to mention the library of things. You're looking at fishing poles here. So we have that. We have a variety of museum passes you can check out from any one of our libraries. Um, in the very near future, you'll be able to get passes to the Annapolis Maritime Museum. We have lots of Chromebooks and hot spots that people are using. So that's been a tremendous asset. Um, I think you maybe know that we have distributed over 300,000 test kits. We continue to distribute those. So the partnership with the health department has been tremendous. We had the first vaccine clinic in the state at a library at the Bush Annapolis Library. And the masks also are a big part of what we've been doing. Um, I know you, you all are very interested in what's happening with the new libraries. Uh, this this may be a surprise to some of you that the Mountain Road Library, which has been in its current location since I would say 20, no, let's see, 1990, early 1990s, <clears throat> we had a number of, of issues with the landlord over, over the years. So two years ago, our Board of Trustees voted to end that lease, and we have recently secured a lease and signed it uh, for a place at Lakeshore Plaza uh, Shopping Center. So we will be closing that library on June 16th, opening in July at the new Mountain Road Library. Now that will be a five-year lease. And over time, we would hope to get uh, an even better space than that. But it will be kind of like the first Discoveries Library was at, at Westfield Mall. Second thing is that our temporary library 
at Revere Beach will be closing on July the 15th and we'll be opening uh, we'll be opening the new Revere Beach in September. That has been a long delayed project. Um, all kinds of issues happen with supply chain and so on. But we're we're really looking forward to having both of those new libraries up in the Pasadena area uh, soon. So that'll be a great uh, enhanced service for our uh, our users there. In on July first, money becomes available for the beginning of the architect selection and design of the new Glen Burnie Library. That library will be um, bigger than Bush Annapolis because we are adding eight thousand square feet. To the, to the core um, model that Bush Annapolis provided of 32,000 square feet. The 8,000 square feet will be for the Department of Cultural Resources to add its archeology span collections and uh, exhibits and that type of thing. So that will be a two-story library on the existing site at Herondale Shopping Center. And then following that, um, in six years from now, we will start getting the funding to design a new Millersville library, which is likely to be at the uh, Old Mill High School complex, the the not the new the new complex, but the um, the older one. So that that of course the site for that will be finalized once we get into that planning stage six years from now. So you all have been hard at work on library priorities, and we really appreciate that. I want to thank. Um, First of all, thank Delegate Jones for sponsoring two of the bills, as well as other co-sponsors, uh, Delegates Bagnall, uh, Lehman, and then Senators King, Alfreth, and Rosepep on the basic library funding bill. So what? Uh, so that so we appreciate that. And then the State Library Resource Center, uh, we had we had the same uh, the same sponsors and co-sponsors with the addition of Senator Bidel on that second bill. Senator King introduced a capital improvement grant, which would be tremendous. Every year for most years, we've got we've had, um, I believe it was five million dollars, and that's gone up to seven and a half million dollars for all 24 library systems to improve their their libraries. But this, the, you know, the the unmet need has been documented in the hundreds of millions of dollars. So this will be a big help if we can get this one passed. Uh, next, there are several bills that are not funding bills that are that are important, and so we obviously will be um, encouraging passage of, of all three of these bills. And then, lastly, the collective bargaining bill. I know the House has passed um, House Bill sixty five. I believe it is kind of stuck in the Senate at this point. We certainly appreciated Senator Bidel introducing SB six eighty which was the bill that the Maryland Association of Public Library Administrators had crafted over the past year. So if this bill does not get passed this year, uh, we would look forward to seeing, seeing a bill passed next year. The, the idea with the House Bill 65 was to get it amended to get more in line with, uh, with the bill that MAPLA uh, created that was um, really trying to be fair to all of the employees, to the communities, to the unions, and to library management. So uh, we don't know where, exactly what may happen in the rest of this session, but the idea is that that um, Chairman Barnes of the Appropriations Committee had asked us to, to craft a bill that would apply to all library systems to, to create the enabling legislation. So we did that in good faith, and we're now just kind of working through that process. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing and uh, take any questions that any of you may have. And by the way, I want to echo what uh, what our chair of our board of trustees, uh, Chris Nelson, said, which is we really appreciate your support over over the years. This the support you've provided us has has been tremendous, and you know you work with our county people as well, and it's it's just very gratifying to work in a in a community that values their library so much and where the elected officials value the library so much. So thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Alda. I mean, we value not just our libraries, but you as a resource. Um, I'm going to go ahead and open it up to the members. Uh, Delegate Simmons. Uh, how we doing, Skip? It's good to see you again, my old friend. Um, Thank you. I, I had the pleasure of visiting uh, with you and uh, your staff 
uh, recently with my two kids, which was great and uh, to meet and to learn more about the resources that the library have to offer. So I really enjoyed that visit and seeing the wonderful work that y'all are doing countywide, um, you know, here in uh, Anne Arundel County and um, especially for the Glen Burnie Library and the Lithicum Library, uh, which I participate in both of those with my children. We've been a part of book clubs and a little about everything else uh, dealing with those two libraries specifically. Uh, my question to you is this, in North County, we have a very diverse community. Uh, and a lot of that is El Salvadorian Latino. Uh, can you talk to me about some of the initiatives that the library is taking to bridge the gap with the language barrier here in the North County? Uh, yes, let me address that. And also, I'd like to ask uh, Ms. Feldman to to address that. Uh, she she help, she does all of our marketing of all the programming that we're doing. But let me start by saying that we are very actively um, adding to our staff who speak Spanish. So that's one one area that we have have been working on quite a bit. Uh, we have a request in to the county executive to get a recruiting specialist and an equity officer uh, in this budget. And so we're hoping to really be able to better reflect the community in our staffing. Uh, so we do a lot of, of work that way. Um, I think that all of our programs uh, go countywide. And so and so uh, it, it's not just North County, but uh, Christine, could you perhaps address a little bit of, of Delegate Simmons' question? And you need to unmute. <laughs> Ms. Feldman, you seem to be unmuted, but it but but we're not hearing you. Um, can you hear me now? Yes, now we can. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that. So we are doing um, work to try to serve all of our community, in particular the needs of our Spanish speaking customers, because as you said, that that number that demographic is, is growing significantly. Um, in addition to hiring more staff, we're doing uh, Spanish only programming at some locations where there are high uh, numbers of Spanish speaking customers. We're helping with workforce development, offering classes where people can create business plans and really become integrated members of our community. Uh, we offer a community pantry in a number of locations, and we're finding that a lot of our Spanish-speaking customers are being able to take advantage of that service. We have one at Glen Burnie, we have one at Brooklyn Park, and we have one at Discoveries. Um, so we're continuing to address the needs of our Spanish-speaking customers by really trying to find out how we can help, what do they need, um, and be able to deliver those services. Uh, Madam Chair, if you don't mind if I follow up with a question, uh, mm -hmm. I just wanted to, yeah, just wanted to ask about y'all mobile uh, books and things like that. If you could talk a little bit about that mobile program and how yeah. do y'all determine where it goes and how effective is it? Okay, so um, it's very effective and it is an extension of what we have always done. Every one of our libraries has a service area. Uh, so, for example, all the schools in the Anne Arundel County public school system, plus all the private schools, um, are assigned to each branch. And so we regularly get out to pre-K programs, to daycare programs, and so on. We've done that. Um, and now we have just received two new electric vehicles that we're just getting ready to go out and be, uh, one will be based at Brooklyn Park and one, uh, I, I, seen, do you, at any rate, we have them, uh, we'll have them based at certain libraries, but then they will be, um, they will be able to go from other libraries. We also have a, a significantly larger vehicle, think uh, uh, size of a food truck, that uh, has been uh, purchased and is just about ready to go, we think in April, that is tied into the Severn Library. And so it'll go out to Severn Intergenerational Center and to other areas there. But all of our vehicles are going to be accessible to, uh, to be able to be used by other staff to go out. So it's very effective. One of the things we do is we go out with storytellers and programmers who do programs, um, partly in the case, for example, of the licensed child care homes. They are, they are modeling re reading to kids, all the things that we do that are, that are the, the activities that are so closely aligned with kindergarten readiness and, and getting kids to school ready to really, you know, be at, at the level of their peers. So they they do that modeling. They do the programs. They they bring collections of materials for people to check out. 
And and um, so yeah, it's it's quite quite effective. Thank you. You're welcome. I I do want to say uh, it was great to see your kids, uh, Delegate Simmons and um, Delegate Jones. We got to meet your son uh, and tour. I I want to open up to everybody uh, in the delegation. We love to show people what happens here at our headquarters building, and uh, a lot of time, and whether you have kids or not. Um, a lot of times people really enjoy seeing the new books that are down on our lower level. We're right behind recreation and parks and the health department. If you want to see a place that's not a library, but where we do all the behind the scenes stuff. Thank you so much, Mr. Alden. I know that we're looking for opportunities for um, for some delegation field trips during the interim. So we'll be uh, reaching out to you to, to arrange that. Thank you again, Mr. Nelson, Ms. Feldman, Mr. Olive, for being here for all you do, not just for our libraries, but all of your community engagement um, and outreach as well. Um, thank you so much for being here today. Thank we you, have Sean. one final, oh, you are very welcome. We have one final um, uh, presentation today from ARC of Central Chesapeake Region, um, Greg Snyder. Of course, ARC um, uh, provides services and supports for our constituents with intellectual and developmental disabilities. They're um, a staple of our community. So welcome, welcome, Mr. Snyder. Thanks so much, Madam Chair. I'm gonna share my screen. I have a quick PowerPoint presentation, if that's okay. Yes, go ahead. Um, can you see that okay? We can. Great. Thank you so much. And good morning to the members of the Anne Arundel County delegation. My name is Greg Snyder and I'm the Chief of Staff at the Arc Central Chesapeake Region. For new members of the delegation that may not be familiar uh, with the Arc Central Chesapeake Region, we started in 1961 with a group of Anne Arundel County public school parents who envisioned a different future for their children with intellectual and developmental disabilities um, in Anne Arundel County. Since then, the ARC has grown dramatically and now supports people with disabilities and their families across the entire region. So the ARC Central Chesapeake region, we cover Anne Arundel County and Maryland's Eastern Shore. Um, but for today's presentation, I wanted to focus on our continued growth throughout Anne Arundel County. Um, the ARC's programs and services uh, support the full spectrum of a person's life uh, from birth to retirement and all the joys that come in between with that. Um, like I said, for today's presentation, I specifically wanted to highlight our growth and services um, throughout Anne Arundel County, and I'm happy to answer any questions that the delegation might have afterwards. So in March of 2022, um, with our continued growth and uh, expansion of services, we undertook a new strategic plan, uh, which is titled Leading Boldly. And with that, we wanted to rethink our vision, mission, and values. So on this slide, you'll see um, that we have updated those. So our new vision is that people with intellectual and developmental disabilities will live the lives they choose in communities that are equitable, accessible, and fully inclusive. Our new mission is that we support people with intellectual and developmental disabilities to live the lives they choose by creating opportunities, promoting respect and equity, and providing access to services. And then our values, I won't read all of them, but uh, they are, we, are, we embrace individuality, we are heart-driven, we take strategic risks, we are action oriented and we promote respect and equity. So with that, um, I wanted to highlight our growth in services. So on this slide, you'll see our growth in a number of uh, programs in Anne Arundel County. Mr. Um, Mr. Snyder, I don't I don't mean to interrupt you, but your your slides aren't progressing. So we're still looking at the first slide. I'm sorry. It's all right. All right, now we, now, we, now, now we see growth in services. Okay, is it showing everything though? That'll be fine. Um, so the growth in services, on this slide you'll see the growth in services across various programs in Anne Arundel County. So at the start of 2020, um, in the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, the ARC expanded our behavioral health services to meet the needs and experiences of the people that we support. Um, the pandemic was challenging for all of us, but as you can imagine, in particular, it was even more challenging for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities who rely on routine and structure in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, so the ARCS Behavioral Health Services builds on our holistic approach to services, which allows for flexibility in helping people understand and access the services that best fit their needs. So 
in March of 2020, we hired a behavioral health clinician and a senior director of behavioral health, and they developed a mental health program at the ARC that has a focus on trauma-informed care. So previously in the past, it was kind of a more one-size-fits-all behavioral support plans for people with disabilities. And with the challenges of the pandemic, uh, we really wanted to um, expand our behavioral health services and meet the needs of um, the people that we support. So in FY20, we had 21 participants in Anne Arundel County and the Midshore. Um, and in FY 2022, we have 22 participants. So you'll see some growth there. And then our supported living, um, the ARC can also help people with disabilities uh, live in homes of their choice and supported living services facilitating independent living in the community. This option focuses on a person's individual needs in a home not owned or maintained by the ARC. While the ARC staff um, do not live in the home, they can be easily reached for emergencies, provide services and supports for those folks. Um, in FY20, we had one participant in that program in Anne Arundel County, and in FY2022, we now have 25 participants in that. Um, for community living, in this option, one for adults with disabilities live together as housemates, each with their private bedroom, shared living space, um, and the ARC owns the home and provides for the maintenance and upkeep of the home and the property in a typical renter landlord setup. Um, additionally, the ARC brings in the necessary resources for the residents, such as independent support, nursing care, uh, managing money, and transportation. Um, these professionals, they're called direct support professionals, and they help people with personal care, meal planning, shopping, booking, getting to their appointments and activities, and thriving in the community. Um, so in FY20, in that program, we had two participants in Anne Arundel County, and we now have 73 uh, participants in FY2022. And then finally, the fourth category is personal supports. This um, is more on a one-to-one -one basis, and these supports can be used for a broad scope of options depending on the individual's needs. Um, personal support services can involve assistance in dressing or bathing, maintaining a schedule, getting to doctor's appointments. Um, and this is focused on creating skills and experiences that, that improve self-sufficiency and quality of life. Um, in FY20, we had 88 participants in that, and in FY2022, we had 95. So in the next slide, uh, I'll highlight the growth in the number of employees. Um, so DSP stands for direct support professionals. Those are the folks that work on the front lines directly with the people that we support. Um, in March of 2020, we had 277 DSPs. And in March of 2023, we now have 354 DSPs to meet the needs of the people we support. Um, Self-directed services. So uh, in that program, we had 15 employees in March of 2020, and in March of 2023, we now have 40. Um, for those that may not be familiar, self-directed services, uh, the ARC is a provider of that. And how that works is we process payroll for the employees, process payments to vendors for authorized goods and services, and provide tax related information to state and federal authorities on behalf of participant. This is kind of grounded in the principles of self-determination and give waiver participants and families greater control of the services they receive. So rather than receiving direct supports from the ARC, uh, they are able to hire their own staff and um, choose the services that they want through that program. And then finally, um, third category is non-DSPs. You'll see the growth there. Um, in March of 2020, we had 44 uh, staff in that category and we now have 75. So with all that, there's exciting things happening at the ARC. Um, we have growth in services, growth in number of employees, um, and there's a, now a need for additional space. So we are, um, as we continue to meet the needs of the community, we realize that our current headquarters in Severn has reached capacity and to better support our growing operations. We are proud to announce that the ARC's new corporate headquarters will be at 999 Corporate Boulevard in Lithicum. Um, that is set to open in April. Um, so who will be moving to this new uh, location? That will include our corporate headquarters, the office of the CEO, uh, finance, external relations, people and culture, self-directed services, stakeholder relations. Um, this headquarters will also operate as a shared space for programs that will include an additional community hub and behavioral health suite. I just would like to thank um, Senator Feidel and Delegate Chang for submitting a bond bill for this location. And we were hoping with that bond bill that we were able to build out our behavioral health suite at Linthicum, as well as adding an adult changing station. Um, so currently in the county, uh, there's two adult changing stations, one at 
um, BWI Airport and the other is at our Severn office. The reason that's important for the people we support, um, typically if uh, they aren't able to easily access an adult changing station, they oftentimes would have to go back to their homes. So the more adult changing stations there are in the community throughout the county, um, the better access uh, that the people we support will have to different services in the communities that they live in. Um, so, like I said, these will be the folks that are going to be at 999 Corporate Boulevard. And then briefly, I wanted to give um, a quick update on Chesapeake Neighbors, which is our affordable housing subsidiary. Um, I'd like to thank uh, some of the delegates here have come and gotten tours of some of our Chesapeake Neighbors homes. We're always uh, love to have people come and visit with us. So if anybody would like to visit some of our Chesapeake Neighbors homes or any of our locations, please let us know. Um, so Chesapeake Neighbors was founded in 2007 by the Arts of Chesapeake region as an independent organization to advance the idea of safe, affordable, accessible housing to people with disabilities and also low-income families in the community. Um, we believe that access to housing is fundamental to a good quality of life. And the core focus of Chesapeake Neighbors is expanding the options for people who traditionally do not have access to quality, affordable housing. Um, so it started with one home in Anne Arundel County in 2007, has now grown to over 50 um, that are owned and managed um, affordable, accessible units across Central Maryland and the Eastern Shore of Maryland. Um, it is our hope in the next three years through our strategic plan to add an additional 100 units of affordable housing. And um, just some quick stats on that, over 90% of the tenants on all the homes are at or below 30% AMI. And the other 10% are at or below 60% AMI. And then finally, I would just like to end with our Lithium Open House. Everyone should have received an invitation to our open house on April 20th. That'll be from 4 to 6 p.m. Um, at our new Lithium office at 999 Corporate Boulevard. And with that, I am happy to answer any questions. While I'm waiting for the members, I just want to say thank you again for all of your work in supporting our intellectual and de developmentally um, disabled residents, um, we 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 know that 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 uh, that your work is really meaningful. I was actually on. I had the pleasure of being on the self-directed services work group um, with uh, then delegate um, Karen Lewis Young, now senator, um, and 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 getting to see uh, that work firsthand was was uh, really incredible. Uh, delegate Simmons followed by delegate Chisholm. Uh, yes, thank you. And thank you for the work that the ARC is doing on behalf of our community. Uh, just wanted to ask you some questions just about some background uh, to the agency uh, and the clients that y'all are serving. Can you give me a little bit about the age uh, um, that clients that you are dealing with? What's that age look like? Um, you know, and also how are people referred to your agency? Thank you so much for the questions, Delegate. So our the majority of our populations are adults 21 plus. Um, so we have adults. I think our oldest person we support is in their um, 80s, which is great. Um, what we've seen over the past decade is the life expectancy for adults with disabilities has increased because their quality of lives has increased. So we are really happy with that. But we also have a children, youth, and their families program where we work with local school systems to help families navigate, navigate the IEP process in schools. And then also for high school students that are uh, um, about to graduate or get their certificates uh, through the local school system to help work with them to let them know these are options available to them once they turn 21. So how it works, we have a manager of enrollment who works with um, families throughout all of our jurisdictions and basically walks them through the entire process um, Get, lays out all the different services that we provide, and then based off their needs or their abilities, they determine what services may be best for them. Throughout that process, uh, the family may determine that the ARC isn't the best fit for them. So what we do is we work with the local DDA, CCS offices throughout our region and connect them with service providers who may be a better fit for them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Delegate Chisholm. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to say thank you, Greg, for everything you guys do. I obviously I do some work with OBI, Providence Center, Belleville Cree, the ARC. All of you guys do tremendous work, and I know you kind of work all together. 
I've got a deeper dive stuff. So it, I'm, I've already asked my uh, chief of staff to reach out to you today. Absolutely. And I just want to have a conversation with about a bunch of different things that too deep to get into here. But once again, thank you for everything you do. You guys, you, you truly do God's work and I, I appreciate it. And thank you. Well, thank you, Delegate. We'll be happy to work with your staff and coordinate a time for uh, all of us to meet. Thank you so much. And, and as, as I mentioned, we're always looking for opportunities um, for uh, delegation uh, field trips during the interim. So I've, I've written down Chesapeake neighbors homes as well. Um, so we'll make sure we'll, we'll reach out to you and, um, and uh, make that information available to the delegation. Yes, we would love to have everyone. Um, Delegate Bartlett actually joined us two months ago. And we were able to show her some. So we'd love to have the rest of the delegation as well. Thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you for all the work that you do. Um, that concludes our guests for today. Um, uh, as I mentioned, we are very excited on Monday to welcome uh, Delegate Gary Simmons back in person. It was wonderful to have you today uh, virtually. Um, I do want to mention to all of our members also Monday night will be the District 31 and the District 33 District Night. Um, so I'm going to open it up to uh, Delegate Chisholm and then Delegate uh, Prusky to talk about the, the district nights. Thank you, Madam Chair. In honor of Mr. Gary Simmons coming back, we have decided to have District 31 night this Monday from 5.30 to 7.30. It's going to be a black wall hitch. Obviously, it's it's free. Please, it's welcome to all. Um, we'd love to see you out there. There's a cash bar. But once again, it's 5.30 to 7.30 this coming Monday, a black wall hitch, easy walk, um, you need to, we would send somebody to pick up Gary Simmons if, if, he, if need be and get him there. All I can tell you is it's an incredible uh, menu. I asked my chief of staff, Asia, to put together. There is um, bacon wrapped scallops is all I really saw on there. And that should be enough to get everybody out there. Look forward to seeing you Monday. Thank Delegate. you, Delegate Chisholm. Thank you. Delegate Rogers, you 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 had a you had a comment. Go ahead. I, I had a comment slash question. So, <clears throat> Delegate Chisholm, will will the district night include a a tie competition between Delegate Simmons and Schmidt to see who has the uh, the best Maryland tie? I think it should. I think that's a great opportunity to to, to create some friendly competition between two tie uh, connoisseurs. I, and, and I would I would be remiss if I didn't mention that. Um, Delegate Smith, you might want to get ready because I've seen that Delegate um, Simmons has the uh, commemorative Judiciary Committee's jacket that uh, has name and everything and is all embroidered. So you better watch out. <laughs> well, Delegate Rogers, to that point, um, if if we want to have that friendly competition at a district night, we can have it at the District 33 district night, which is also on Monday. And uh, Delegate Prusky is going to fill in the details for us. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, District 33 night is back uh, after a few years of hiatus. Uh, it is also on Monday, March 27th from 530 to 730. It is at Smashing Grapes in Annapolis, uh, which is on 177 Jennifer Road. Uh, we asked invitees if they are to come that they can carpool because, as you know, the parking right now in Annapolis is a little hectic. Uh, I don't know what the menu is at District 31 night, but District 33 is better. Uh, so I just, you know, if we have a little competition here, uh, but this is again, on behalf of Senator Guile, uh, Delegate Bagnell, Delegate Schmidt, uh, 33, uh, is inviting everyone, uh, to stop in, uh, for that. And we appreciate it. And we, we ask anybody, uh, regardless of where they live in Anne Arundel County, maybe they can come to both, but, uh, thank you, Madam Chair, for allowing me to, uh, to provide that information. Absolutely. You, know, you do the whole circuit. Delegate yeah. Rogers. <laughs> Absolutely. So I just want to know, um, Delegate Prusky, will will District 33 night include a, a Bruce Berriano impersonation competition? Um, I mean, you just tore it up with that skit last night. So I just wondered if um, you're going to have any competitors going to compete against you doing Bert, Bruce Berriano impersonations. I, I don't know. We'll have to see who shows up, but uh, we're certainly inviting the public. So thank you, Delegate Rogers. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. Um, with that, I, I, I have nothing more to add. Um, thank you so much for a really good um, a, a really good session. Uh, we will be meeting, as I said, we will be meeting next week um, 
uh, to vote on the bills we heard today, as well as we'll have the capital budget subcommittee uh, meeting. So watch your email for, for details because um, because we need to, to get all of that uh, sorted out. Um, with that, uh, do I have a motion to adjourn? So move. Second. We are moved and seconded. Um, we will see you on the floor. Um, and to everyone else, have a great weekend and thanks so much for being here.